the forward presentation. All right. Okay, let me share my screen. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Yep. All right, Liz, take her away. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm a little nervous doing these things, so just give you a heads up. But we do have Gail, the author of the book here, um, who's going to take the first part, uh, introduce herself a little bit. And um, there's a story that I definitely chose out of the book that uh, I feel uh, probably everybody will um, understand it. And um, yeah, she's going to read that for me and, and get us started. And um, we'll go from there. And like I said, I have posted this a couple times on the website as well, but that is the book that we took the presentation from. And Gail is here with us, the author of the book, and uh, we'll let her take the first part. All right. Take her away, Gail. Well, thank you, Jones. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. I'm Gail Weatherill. I'm the culprit, uh, the caregiver's guide to dementia, practical advice for caring for yourself and for your loved one. Um, that was a book that had been rolling around in my head for several years, and um, I was thankful somebody lit a fire under me, and we finally got it down on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of background about me, so, and you should always ask that, because there are a lot of people out there that will tell you a lot of things about dementia. Mm -hmm. So you should know who you're talking to and whether they know what they're talking about. My little dance card started, I've been an RN for 40, going on 41 years, and I'm just getting started, so be careful. <laughs> I started out the first 20 years of my career, I worked in medical intensive care, mostly in teaching hospitals. And the greatest gift I got from that that I use now is I did so much end of life care that it carries over. I've always been fascinated by that. I've always had a heart for what families were going through in that process. And that has carried through into my years in dementia care. So I worked in the hospital and it was fun until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then I did home care for a while. I've done hospice, but for the really for the last 20 years, I've been working in dementia care, whether it was in home health I did private care management in the community. I was kind of a hired gun for families. And um, then I got tapped for a um, combined nursing home assisted living for the director of nursing position. And I did that for several years. And then it was time to fly my wings again. So I came up with my professional alter ego, which is the dementia nurse. And it's been fun and games since then. I do a lot of uh, speaking, writing when I can't help it. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I do is I, I help run a caregiver's closed support group on Facebook. Um, it's the Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregivers Support Group. We started that, excuse me, many years ago. And at this point, we've got 53,000 members from over a hundred different countries. If you had told us that eight years ago when we started, I told you you were crazy, but you know, there's something about, it's a global problem. And if anybody's ever feeling alone, all they have to do is hop on that group and you will know. Um, and the reassuring thing about a lot of it is we all have the same problems. Um, I say we because I've also, in addition to professionally, I've done family caregiving. Um, I cared for an aunt for a few years in my home until she passed away. And right now my father has vascular dementia. So, and I get real crazy when people who no offense, Jocelyn and Liz, I'm sure neither one of you would do this, but sometimes people who work in the biz um, don't realize that unless you've done it 24 seven in your own home, it's, it's a different ball game 
than doing an eight or 12 hour shift and then going home. So anyway, that's all I know, probably more. And Liz asked me to read, she says, I want you to read one of the vignettes at the beginning of the chapters. And that's the way I set the book up. I've got a little vignette at the beginning of each chapter to kind of give you a feel for what I'm going to be talking about. And she says, I want you to do chapter seven. And I opened it up and I looked and I was like, oh my God, that one's going to make me cry. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because I have such a heart for caregivers. You know, I know that if I want to help people with dementia, the best thing I can do that's going to make the biggest difference is help their caregivers. And there actually have been studies that have shown that the number one factor in the well being of someone with dementia is the mental and emotional health of their primary caregiver. So, you know, when we talk about paying attention to how this whole process is affecting you, that's not just because we love you. It's because we know that that more than the medications, more than what neurologists you see, more than what supplements you give, that is the thing that makes or breaks how your loved one's days go. So I'll throw that out there. And without further ado, uh, the name of chapter seven is How Caregiving Affects You. And I told Jocelyn and Liz, I said, if this was the only chapter people read, this is my primary message. Um, so, all right, our little buddy Jocelyn. Jocelyn stared at the woman in the mirror, wondering who she was. She knew she saw this woman every day when she brushed her teeth or did her hair. So when did that woman become a stranger? Jocelyn was 52 when her mother moved in with her. Mom had vascular dementia and wasn't safe to be alone anymore. Six years later, Jocelyn tried to remember when her own hair turned to more gray than brown. When did the extra chins appear? How had she given up on that woman in the mirror? That question wasn't hard to answer. Her days started anywhere from 4 a.m. and 9 a.m. From then until late night, it was all go, go, go. Getting mom to appointments, doing laundry, grocery shopping, the list felt endless. Looking back in the mirror, Jocelyn felt a twinge of resentment. None of her friends had the responsibilities she did. They weren't working full time and coming home just in time to see the age shoot out the drive like a rocket. They didn't spend their entire weekend doing a thousand chores. And then there were her siblings. They bragged on Facebook with vacation pictures, new landscaping for the house, a child's birthday party. But not one of them had spent more than half an hour at a time with their mother in the last two years. And with that, I'm guessing some of that had some things you could relate to. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Liz. Alrighty. So, so I, I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, Gail, just so you know, and I have actually went through it. The last three chapters I did a few times, actually, myself. And I went through it and I, you know, took a couple of or quite a few things out of it, um, things that I hear uh, often from uh, family members, whether it be uh, ones that are, you know, living here, their loved ones are here, and some that, you know, are calling for advice and things like that. And, you know, you, you become quite um, emotionally involved. So for anybody that doesn't know us, um, we are Carlton Place Terrace by Symphony Senior Living. There, we have four homes. Symphony Senior Living has four homes. Um, three of us do specialize in our memory care. So we have assisted living and memory care. 
Myself, I'm located in Carlton Place, and then we have two in Orleans and one in Canada. So this, this here, the emotional and physical toll, which Gail was just talking about, you know, you find that the, um, I guess, learning the, the, the dementia diagnosis is, is quite um, emotional for a lot of people. And like she says here, we are on a bus ride down a congested street and there's no driver at the wheel. And I have a feeling that a lot of people feel that way. Um, and as she said too, it's a voluntary job and we always have the right to walk away. I mean, with that obviously comes an emotional toll with that as well. Um, there are other options out there, you know, it becomes too much. She says, you don't have to sacrifice yourself in the process. It's a matter of, for me and for what I see, it's a matter of, of allowing yourself to look outside the box and, and look outside just yourself doing it, whether you're speaking to friends, family, even coworkers. Another thing that I, I find that people don't necessarily know is that you know, it, the, the dementia caregiving can last for, for years. It's not something that is, you know, here one day and gone the next. Um, and like I said, when going back to it, like she was saying, you have to accept help from people that are close to you, or even if you have to look outside of a family and friends, there are a lot of groups out there that can help you connecting with other connect, they said with like other caregivers, like look, for example, with Gail's uh, Facebook page, that, that's just amazing and then some smaller groups as well and of course nowadays with things the way they are a lot of it's gone online and by zoom like we're doing right now so um stress and anxiety frustration whether with yourself or with your loved one um a huge guilt factor of course right and physical issues with people doing lack of exercise not eating properly so it, it all comes down to taking like she said taking care of yourself so she's had some tools to cope with stress and anxiety, um, physical activity. And one thing I, I was, when I was reading with that is that it doesn't have to be, you know, you're going to the gym for half an hour. It could be, you're just gonna go for a walk, right? Uh, for five minutes, you know, you're going to go out in the backyard. You're gonna, you know, just tour around a little bit and scheduling time away was another thing that she had really focused on. Meaning that you can't be there 24 seven. You also need time to step away. And that's the good for yourself as well as the one you're caregiving for. And learning to say no, which, which I think all of us have a hard time saying that in, in a lot of different you know, situations. Breathing exercises, probably something that all of us should learn. Some of us are good with that, some of us are not. <laughs> Keeping a journal, also something that, that you know, gives you an idea of what's going on when, trying to get things kind of organized eating healthy, of course, and talking with a counselor, if that's something that you feel will help you. Um, you know, it's somebody that's not gonna judge so much so, and you'll see later on that, you know, one of the things that I'm gonna mention, and she talked about was that sometimes when you tell people, oh, you know, my mom has dementia, it's like, oh no, or they don't understand exactly what that means. Frustration and anger. Yes. Well, that comes with a lot of things, especially, like I said, when you're dealing with a loved one, um, you know, you don't, you're, you're frustrated with yourself. I find a lot of people get frustrated with themselves, not knowing what to do, um, not knowing how to handle things. Um, and, you know, you're, you feel angry, but you don't know, I guess, how to, what's the correct word, Gail, how to, I guess, deal with it, right? How to let it out. And how understand to, how to experience it rather than stuffing it okay. without, you know, going totally ballistic, which is the reason you need to experience it, because if you don't, it accumulates and then we all go ballistic. Yeah, yeah not keeping it in, right? So, right. yeah. <laughs> Sadness and depression. So, this is, I've heard this before too, the dementia has been called the long goodbye for a reason. Gail, do you wanna give a little bit of information on that and why they say that? Well, it, you know, it's one of those things and it's, it's one of the big things that sets this disease apart from any other illness for the most part. Um, there are some other long-term chronic diseases, but some of them are quite like dementia because you don't know 
what the next step is going to be. You don't know when the next change is going to come. And you don't know what it's going to look like. And you don't know if you're going to be doing this for two years or 12 years. And so there's just so many unknowns. And you're constantly living with that anxiety on top of bearing witness to the things that your loved one is losing a little bit at a time or sometimes a lot at a time and then plateauing and then losing a lot more again. So it's, we all know what the outcome's gonna be. It is gonna be goodbye. Um, and so between grieving for what we're losing along the way and anticipating what the end of this journey is going to look like is it's it affects us whether we acknowledge that or not it you cannot be a human being and not be affected by those factors so they say so we talk about guilt exhaustion and physical issues so and being like I mean, I think a lot of us being our, our own worst enemy, like they said, it isn't just an old saying in the world of dementia. It's, I think, for a lot of different things, right? And there is no manual. I mean, there's no manual for a lot of illnesses, but this one, I would say more so because the fact that you never do know the next step or when it's going to happen and what it's going to be. So Gail and I had a good talk on, I think it was Monday we talked and and to bring back a point, and this may or may not be appropriate, but Gail said, you know, if somebody is diagnosed with lung cancer, you kind of have an idea of what to expect. When it comes to dementia, there is no manual or guide as to what is gonna come next. And like I said, you assume you're doing something wrong when you can't take away the pain, either for ourselves or loved ones need to be more patient, knowledgeable, happier, and more or less assertive. So, I mean, patience is a virtue, as they say, knowledgeable. I mean, it takes time to get knowledgeable on it. There's training, all that stuff, but becoming knowledgeable is also takes time, right? And you may not feel that you have that time. Rest, of course. <laughs> um, when are you gonna rest? As Gail mentioned, it could take years, it could go on for quite a while, but we need to figure out a way to take care of ourselves. You need to take care of, of your body, obviously. Um, your soul and your mind is the only way we can be the best caregiver we can possibly be. And who can help you? Always the question, right? Uh, doctors, therapists, if you're comfortable with that, uh, willing friends and family can help. And, and one thing that you should point out in her book is this, to cast your net wide from the very beginning to yield the best results. As soon as you have that diagnosis, as soon as you have um, the chance to reach out to you know, friends, family, um, support groups, um, the sooner you can start that, the better off it's gonna be for you. Work and life balance. You know, work can bring a lot of good things to you when it comes, I said, for like they said, financially, socialization, feelings of competence and adult conversations. Um, you know, a couple of suggestions she made in here was, you know, can you do some of your work from home? Um, can you possibly go down to part time hours? Um, can you, you know, work your schedule around things that you need to do with your loved one or, or times that you can have somebody else come in and do the caregiving for you. And you need to be honest. You need to be honest with your, with your boss, with your coworkers and let them know what's going on. Community services, excellent. I know here Carlton Place, Lanark leads Grenville. Um, you know, there, it, it's excellent. One conversation that we did have um, was I was saying about the high school students here and how many hours and all that stuff they have to do. But it could be simply something like, you know, cutting your lawn. It takes you time to do it. Um, so maybe that's something that you can, you know, how the neighbor's kid do it or, you know, $10 or whatever it is. I think I pay more than that to the kid next door. But anyways, 
you know, something that helps them and also helps you. But at the same time, there isn't that financial strain. Friends, like I said, family, anything like that. Just, you know, you kind of make a list of things that take a lot of time for you to do, but you don't necessarily have to do them. Staying healthy, of course, yes. So I actually really liked um, this section here, Gail. Um, exercise, it does, it, it costs nothing. So there, I mean, there are people that go to the gym and all this stuff, but you know, it doesn't have to be that. It can be, as she said, you know, it costs nothing, you can do it anytime. Um, I like this one, you know, if you're feeling stressed, you remember to switch gears and head outside for 10 jumping jacks. Simple, takes a few minutes, go out the back door, you know, do it, come back in. I thought that was an excellent one. So try moving for the sake of moving. This is your reward and you will feel better. So maybe, you know, up, walk around the house, go out, walk around the gardens, come back in. Um, it just gives you, it's good for you to have that break mentally and it helps physically. Eating right, yes. Well, I guess no matter what, all of us should eat right. Um, but I know, you know, you tend to be, to lack in that, you tend to, you know, eat things that are, you know, fast, quick, you know, you drive through, you, you know, get a bagel or, you know, something like that, right? Instead of actually having a, a nutritious meal. But the nutritious meal is, is not only good for you, but it's good for your loved one as well. So, you know, fruit, veggies, especially, in the summer when they're all really nice and good and local. Um, and they did, yeah, I did actually, I was thinking about doing this myself is uh, to keep a food diary for a week, not just because you're the caregiver, but just any of us, right? To see what you're eating when you're eating, you know, when you find that you're, you know, just grabbing things as you go and then hydration. Well, that's, I mean, for all of us, anytime, any day, right? So staying connected, of course. Um, there's lots of, of obviously dementia caregivers out there, um, but everybody and a lot of people I talk to find that they don't know who to talk to about it. Um, and, you know, finding somebody that understands it, somebody that's been through it, somebody that is, um, you know, going through the same thing. Because when I was reading through the book, I noticed that, and it's very true that you know, you as a dementia caregiver, there's often things that another person that's a caregiver for dementia has gone through or asked themselves or, you know, you kind of jump, you know, bounce ideas off each other. Um, and like I said before, you know, it said that there is no diagnosis that makes people disappear faster. Do you want to comment on that, Gail? Oh, my. Um... Well, I probably don't need to say a whole lot about it because I think it's pretty much a universal experience that, that people, you know, friends, well-meaning, whatever, but they tend to drop away over time. You mentioned um, spiritual health earlier. One of the soapboxes that makes me insane to get up on is the disappearance of people from faith communities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hear it every week. I get at least two inquiries about this. It'll be someone who has, you know, a, been part of a church community for the last 40 years. They were the deacon, they were the church secretary. They, you know, they'd been tithing all these years. They'd been like a pillar in the community. Three months into not being able to go to the church and participate, and it's like you're dust. Mm -hmm. Everybody's forgotten. And um, that one in particular makes me real crazy because heaven knows if there's any time that a faith community is needed if that's part of your um, repertoire of dealing with life boy this is the worst time to be deserted with that and I certainly would assert that that is contradictory to what most faith communities teach that's all I say about that <laughs> 
<laughs> no, and it's true. You can't control how other people are going to react to it. You can educate them and, you know, try to explain things to them and, and that, but, you know, at the end of the day, you cannot control how they're going to react to you. So um, she said, you know, share the details on your loved one's current state. So, you know, a typical day in the life of, if there is such a thing as a typical day in the life of, maybe would help people understand, you know, a few things that do happen every day. Um, you know, and love the fact that you keep a calendar that you tick off and commit to using to make sure you have outside conversation. So important to talk to, you know, other people, um, can be, you know, friends, neighbors, coworkers, anything like that. Um, and not necessarily just the person you're caring for. I just want to um, interject right there real quick, Liz. One of the things I really encourage people to do is to have yourself a mental list. And if I'm going to have a mental list, I have to have a physical list. Make a list, brainstorm what are some things that I can give to someone who says, well, if you need anything, just call me because that's what everybody says. Well, you call me if you need me. Well, no, you should be calling me yes. and saying, you know, I thought I'd come by and pick up your laundry this week and get some of that done for you. Um, so I really encourage people to think about whether it's you know, some of the grocery shopping, the tours around the house, whatever, whatever it is, when somebody says, if you need anything, call me, you can say, well, actually, you know, I was thinking, because most of the time, it's kind of a, it's hard to know what people's motives are. So whether they're saying that because it's a socially acceptable way of saying, see ya, or if it's because they really don't know what would be helpful to you. Okay, um, so to be a certain, not to tell people the truth about what you need is kind of where that goes back to. Yeah. And like, it goes back to, you know, like cutting the grass, it's something that you have to do, right? Mm -hmm. Something simple, right? That's also in the way it's exercised for you and gets you out of the house. So you know, we kind of back and forth as to what can and cannot help you, right? So, and the support groups. So at the end of this, I put some local support groups that I know of around this area in Ottawa, um, but there's so many more than what I've listed. So there's lots, lots of different ones. And, you know, and you'll see this later on too, is that you have to give them a chance to, I believe you suggested at least going twice to make sure that one, you know, the first time you go, you're not used to it, you don't know the people, maybe it'll take two or three times before you say, you know, no, this really isn't the right fit for me. And it may take, you know, you may be involved in more than one support group because, you know, this support group, you know, has, you know, so many people that deal with this problem, but you also have this issue, right? And, you know, you just, you're um, giving yourself different options of who you can talk to, right? And share with. <laughs> The memory cafes. So we actually do. I, I did send put a link as well to the memory cafes that are in the area. Um, <coughs> one here that I know of, um, they, it's for both the caregivers as well as the person that you're caring for. So a little bit of different different ideas you can see. Um, I know what the um, I put it here, but the Alzheimer's Society, the one that I have here at Lanark, Leeds, and Grenville. Um, they have a whole link to the memory connections cafes so and different programs that they do so and like I said here you know keep in mind that you need to be comfortable in the group that you're in be kind to yourself <laughs> this is for everything right it's important to remember that we indulge in self-criticism I mean who doesn't right um, you know if you're not emotionally stable then that's going to bounce off the person that you're caring for. You need to know your limits, be kind to yourself, and remember that you do have options. Now, we're gonna get, what if you do not have a good past relationship with this person? That was a, yeah, you know, I read that and I went, you know what? That is a really good point. Gail, did you wanna comment on this? Yeah, I will. Um... 
because that's one of the things that comes up a lot in our online support group. You know, everybody kind of assumes, oh, well, this is your mother. And so, you know, you have these warm feelings. Well, you know, did I fail to mention that, you know, she beat me senseless at least twice a week. Every week I was growing up, there was a new man in the house every weekend. You know, we don't know what other people's situation was. And not every parent, not every husband or wife, not every sibling is someone we have warm, fuzzy feelings for. Um, a lot of times it somehow ends up that the care of someone, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be real honest, my dad has been a flaming narcissist as long as I could remember. And I have to limit, I mean, I can go, he lives in Florida, I can go down there for four months at a time. Um, but I can't go for longer than that because he still is who he is. And so I just put that in there because I want people to realize that no matter how folks talk about caregivers, you're not alone if the person you're caregiving for is someone who has not treated you particularly well in the past and you're not particularly thrilled to have the quote unquote privilege of being their caregiver. That's all. Oh, wait. Oh, no. I skipped it. Oh, no. She skipped one. Oh, so, no. oh, anyways, no. that's I all right. <laughs> so many of them. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay. She's fired from doing that. <laughs> Next time we won't have her come and help me. No, I'm just kidding. I pressed it one too many times. Yes, you did press it one too many times. Don't go backwards. But um, if you don't, I did see that you had a bunch of. Yes websites on there yes i did yeah which we there you go there's okay. that one there you go, there we go. <laughs> that's what it was okay and then i just said about being kind to yourself you know you can say no um you know there's a lot of there is options out there for respite time away uh from caregiving so that could be you know which is done once again um we can do it through the alzheimer's society um uh, for symphony senior living we do have uh, a program as well that we can do day aways or, or nights away, uh, you know, respite stays as well. Um, and like I said, it's just, it's as, as good for you as it is for the person that you're caring for. Mm -hmm. You know, the, like I said, there's many days that you're the one that needs the love the most versus the person that you're caring for, so. I will add one there, darling. Mm -hmm. um, you can find me at thedementianurse.com. Um, I'll add that in after so we have it. Thank you. I Deborah. post it when I post it. Um, yeah, because th that way you can, and you can find, I have a page under that name on Facebook, but I have a, a separate yeah. website, thedimensionnurse.com. And I've got some links to uh, several resources there. So stop by and see me. And you can always send me a message through that. Okay, yeah, and I went on your Facebook page too as well, so it's great. So, and well, we all, I love this. So, that laughter is timeless, imagination has no end, and dreams are forever. Okay, Walt, Dis Walt Disney. All right, so that's the end of our presentation. I'm going to stop the uh, recording. Yep. And okay. now it's questions and answers. Yes. So, so Miss Gail is. Yeah. Ask me anything. I know.